opportunity we have this morning to be in this building. Some of us, we think we're here because of a dedication, or we, we think he we're here because we were invited by a friend. But we're actually here because we have a divine appointment with you. You orchestrated this. It's not coincidence or by chance that we're finding ourselves sitting in this building. And also, Father, as human beings, we have no guarantee of our tomorrows. So this may be our once-off opportunity to sit in a place and listen to God's Word. We may never get another opportunity to listen to the Word. We may never have another tomorrow. But we've got today, Lord, and we've got this moment, and we want to make it count. We want to hear what's on your heart. And so, Father, we just say thank you for this moment in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we're going to be going live stream real soon. We have an opportunity to connect with people around the world right now from this place on live stream. What an opportunity. What a privilege and what a blessing. And so we pray for everyone that is sitting in their homes this morning that from this place they will be impacted with your presence and your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are we ready? Fantastic. A very good morning to all our online viewers and listeners. We want to say thank you for tuning in this morning to our live stream broadcast here from Impact Family Church in East London to South Africa. We welcome you. We pray that you will just sit back this morning, have your Bibles ready, have your notepads ready, and let's hear what God wants to encourage us with this morning, and let's take note of it. I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. We would like to pray with you right now. Let's pray. Father, we want to say thank you that we as a family can come around your word this morning from this place and yet from every home that is connected with us right now. And we pray, God, that you would touch every heart and every hearer, that we will have a time that we will know without a doubt God has spoken to us today. And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been running a series entitled all talk, no action. And we're hoping that over this time, as we're sharing around the subject, is that we're going to change the statement from all talk, no action, to all talk, all action. Because we've come to understand is that if we look at the acronym, ACNA, which stands for all talk, no action, then we're all guilty of being an ACNA from time to time. We're involved in ACNA conversations. All talk, but no action. And we've been challenged not to be that anymore. And I'm challenging you and I this morning just to open our hearts and open our minds to hear from God. How do we live a life where we can be all talk and all action and we can deliver what we promise? You know, you've heard the statement before. Practice what you preach. This morning I'm going to say we learn how to practice what we promise. Practice what we promise. So if you've got your Bibles, this morning we're going to speak about an individual who at a tremendous cost and sacrifice that others were involved in it, kept to his word at all costs. So turn with me to Mark chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 21. Mark chapter 6 from verse 21. It says in verse 21, On his birthday, Herod, King Herod, gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So I want us just to paint a picture here. Here we have a king who is celebrating his birthday. It's a very special occasion for him because it's another year in his life. But here the Bible says that he throws a banquet, not just a birthday party, but a banquet, because a banquet is something that's very formal, and it's very elaborate. It's not just bring out the popcorn. It's about we've got very special guests at this event, and it's a very important moment. The reason I'm kind of stressing is so that we can I want to understand this morning, why did he do that? And it says that he threw this banquet for his high officials and military commanders and leading men. So it wasn't just the average individual that was invited to his birthday celebration. 
It was key individuals within his community, key individuals that were ranked in important positions. Why did he do that? Why couldn't he just have a normal birthday party and just have his family members and his friends? Why did he invite all these very important people to his birthday? Well, let's continue. Verse 22. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And so the king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Yo, this little girl, her name was Salome. And Salome was 12 years of age. Think about it. For those that have a 12-year-old teenager creeping through puberty and into the realm of we know it all, and you say to that 12-year-old, ask me whatever you want. Oh, my word, is that high risk? And now we have a king throwing this important banquet, and in comes this little girl called Salome, who was his stepdaughter, and he was a stepfather to her. What is he trying to do? Is he trying to win her over, knowing that he's not her biological dad? So, you know what, I really got to step up to the plate here. I'm going to try and win her over. And the Bible says that she pleased him in the dance. And she created a great atmosphere. I can imagine all these very important people applauding the dance and applauding the moment. And everybody's enjoying themselves. And this pleased the king even more. And in a moment of being very happy, and everything is going according to plan, he makes a promise. Aren't we guilty of that at times? When you're in the presence of very important people, you want to impress them, and so you make very bold statements and make very bold promises. Because you don't want to let your audience down, or the crowd down, or your dinner guests down. And more than that, you've got this little girl that you're trying to win over still, who's a teenager rolling her eyes at you from time to time. And in that moment when everything seems to be Going according to plan, he says, ask me for anything you want. Oh, my word. I mean, can't you just give me a price range? Give me the range of shops I can go to. You're saying anything, and you're making a promise, I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath. So when you promise something with an oath, an oath is binding. It's a solemn vow. It is some, uh, it's a point of no return. And you're declaring it publicly in front of all these high officials, military commanders, leading men of Galilee. Now you can't turn back and say, yo, this is a mistake. You are making a promise, <laughs> and you're sealing it with a vow, saying, I'm reaching a point of no return, which means I've got to deliver and keep to my word. And he goes on and he says, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. I'm thinking to King Herod, what's wrong with you, Bruce? What's on your mind to make that kind of promise? Half of my kingdom. And your kingdom is huge. And you're promising it to this 12-year-old stepdaughter. This makes no sense. What are you trying to prove? You know, many times we make promises because we're trying to improve something around us. We're trying to prove something before us, or we're trying to impress. In this case, he was trying to win people over. Let me tell you why. We need to go a bit further, though, before I unpack why, because there's always a reason why people make rash vows. What is a rash vow? I shared this with you last Sunday, so I'm just going to refresh your memory. A rash vow is this, making an impulsive promise without careful consideration of the possible consequences. And I'm thinking, you know, King Herod, you're making a very impulsive promise to a 12-year-old. Have you carefully considered what the consequences possibly could be? Do you really, do you really count the cost here by saying half of my kingdom? A rash vow is an action or reaction based upon an intense emotion. People make promises because of, it comes from a place of intense emotion. It's not just, a, I've got a feeling. It's, a, it's an intense emotion. And we've got to understand this morning, what was this 
intense emotion within King Herod's life because some people out of anger or fear or jealousy or resentment or bitterness, they want to pay back, they want to vindicate, they want to justify themselves, they want to be recognized, they want to be loved, they want to be accepted, they want to impress, they want to win over. And by doing it, they make these hasty, rash promises in the hope of winning them over, but not counting the cost. So the question must be, what happened in King Herod's life for him to be in this intense emotional place, for him to make such a hasty promise and seal it with a vow with a 12-year-old in front of all his important dinner guests? So we're going to go back a bit to understand his life story so that we can understand the intense emotions. Because when you come across someone who makes a very rash vow, a promise in a moment of where everything's going according to plan. You feel good. It's a celebration. Everything's going according to plan. You just forget to count the cost. And from that place of intense emotion, we can end up doing things and later on suffer the consequences. So go with me to Mark chapter 6 and from verse 17. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, John the Baptist. And he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. I'm going to point out some things as we go along the line so that we can understand the drama within this family unit. <laughs> A lot of us experience drama. Come on now. I'm speaking about your neighbor now that you watch every day. Stephen DeLon right next to you. You look over the fence, you think you're kind of like cutting your and br pruning your branches. You're watching what they are doing. Such drama. But let's be honest, there's drama in all of our lives. And drama can disrupt our lives. It can rearrange things in our lives. It attracts all kinds of things into our lives. And before you know it, it motivates us in the wrong direction. And before we know it, we activate things we shouldn't activate because we're coming from a place of such... Drama. Is there drama in your home? Is there drama in your workplace? Is there drama in your life? And a lot of people from a place of emotional drama make rash promises because they're not thinking straight. They're overcome and overwhelmed by the drama. And we're going to understand that King Herod, oh my word, was he living in drama, drama of note, and he wasn't thinking straight when he made this promise. Question is, was he just going to be all talk? And no action? Well, let's continue. It carefully says that Herod bound John the Baptist and put him into. Now, firstly, Salome, that 12 year old little girl, she actually was in love with John the Baptist. If you do a careful historical research, she had an eye for John the Baptist, the man of God. And John the Baptist was in his 30s now because he was just a little bit older than Jesus because he was born first. And Elizabeth and Mary were family members and relatives. So John the Baptist was just roughly about 30, 32, 33, roughly around that age. <laughs> and he's put in prison. Can you imagine what this 12-year-old must have think, thought about her stepfather, King Herod? How can you put that man of God that, by the way, I have a crush over, because you can't call it in love. You're 12 years of age. You're still in puberty mode. You're still trying to make sense of everything. But for some reason, you have a crush on a 30-year-old man of God because authority is always attractive. And any man that draws a crowd becomes a very attractive man in the community. And this 12-year-old is like, yo, 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 that's my man, Johnny. Johnny boy. Not Johnny Depp, but Johnny the Baptist. And now my stepfather takes the man of my dreams and puts him into prison. What a cheat. Let me tell you, when a 12-year-old is unhappy, everybody knows. You know, they always say, when mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. But when a 12-year-old ain't happy, nobody's happy. And everybody got to understand that this teenager was not happy. And it says here, he did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. Now listen, let me unpack the drama.
drama because you don't need TV. You just need the Bible. Read it. Maybe sometimes with a bit of age restriction. So Herodias, let's understand her dynamic. She was married to King Herod's brother Philip. She was eight years of age when she was engaged to Philip when Philip was 20 years old. So you need to understand the dynamic. She was eight years of age, engaged to a 20-year-old. Can you see the generational influence from a mother to a daughter, a daughter who's now 12, feeling like it's okay to have a crush on a 30-year-old? Because my mother was eight when she was engaged to my dad, who was 20. But let me say this to you. Herodias wasn't in love with Philip. They got married and she was engaged at such a young age because of the line of royalty that she was in. But later on, King Herod, who is the brother, half-brother to Philip, who is Herodias' uncle, please, uncle, uncle, not just anyone's your uncle, he is your genuine bloodline uncle, arrives on the scene, he's now five years older than Herodias, and Herodias is married, King Herod is married, and they both now have an affair. They both now have an affair. And John the Baptist saw this happening and, and, and saw them get married. And for them to get married, King Herod had to divorce his wife. Herodias had to divorce with her husband so that the two of them could get married, which they did. And Salome, the little 12-year-old, was pulled into another relationship and had to embrace a stepfather. Are you with me? Such drama. Now, let me tell you about the Mosaic Law. Because this is what they broke, was the Mosaic Law. And this is what John the Baptist was pointing out. And this is why Herodias is very angry, because the Herodias wasn't, wasn't wanting to be told that what they did was wrong. So the Mosaic Law says this. You are not legally permitted to marry a bloodline relation. Anyone that is of your blood relation, you cannot marry. You should by right not marry him. He is your uncle, number one. Number two, your husband, Philip, he hasn't died, and now you need someone else to take care of you. He is still alive, so by law, you cannot leave him to marry his brother. That's the second breaking of the Mosaic law. And number three, the law says a man can divorce his wife, but a wife is not permitted to divorce her husband. So guess what? You have broken the law in three areas. And in that community, everyone respected the Mosaic law. So listen carefully now. The military commanders, the important men that came to the birthday, banquet, all these individuals of high ranking, all knew that Herod and Herodias was birthed out of an affair. They all knew that she had committed adultery. She all, they all knew that they broke the Mosaic law which the community respected. So why was Herod throwing such a banquet for his birthday? He was trying to make up where he went wrong. He was trying to win them over. He knew that he had put John the Baptist into prison. He knew that Salome, the 12-year-old, was unhappy with him. He knew that all the military commanders were not impressed with him. He knew he was in a bad place with everyone. And so the intense emotion was, I'm going to impress everyone now. I'm going to, I'm going to make up and I'm going to show everyone that I'm not so bad. So I'll tell you what, Salome, whatever you want, I will... Can you understand where this man is coming from? So let's go back to Scripture. Because of Herodias' brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, he had to put John the Baptist into prison. For John had been saying to Herod, Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. Because how dare you tell me that I am wrong to marry him? I will marry whoever I want to marry. And so she nursed a grudge. You know, just 
the, the, the drama of living with someone in your house who carries the grudge. Think about living with a lady carrying a grudge. Is he dead yet? Have you killed them yet? You know, that man has brought me a lot of heartache. You mean you've only put him in prison? That's not good enough. I want him dead. Can you imagine what Herod has to face every day of his life? The conversations in the household. This is drama. A teenager that's unhappy, be, a, a teenager who's got a crush for a 30-year-old, a wife who's carrying a grudge with the 30-year-old, and now, you know, he's, you know I'm just going to put this man in prison. Now the teenager ain't happy. The wife is still not happy because she actually wants him dead, not just in prison. This is drama. Can you imagine the emotion welled up in King Herod's heart? But she was not able to get him killed because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled. Yet he liked to listen to him because from time to time, King Herod would have conversations with John and John as a man of integrity, as a man of God, would always be pointing out the things that was wrong and telling King, King Herod, what you're doing is wrong. It's unacceptable. And even though King Herod was puzzled and confused and didn't understand it, there was something that was always being pulled towards the truth, but didn't know how to embrace the truth. You know, the Bible also says in Luke chapter 3, and this will not be on your presentation, but I just want to point it out to you. Verse 19, listen to this. Luke chapter 3, verse 19. But when John the Baptist rebuked Herod because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod locked John up in prison. I need you to know that King Herod had a reputation, not of what he just did with Herodias, not just because he broke the Mosaic law, but as a king, he had a reputation of doing a lot of evil things. In actual fact, later on in Luke chapter 13, verse 31, Jesus makes a statement about King Herod. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else because King Herod wants to kill you. And so Jesus replies, go tell that fox. I'm still going to fulfill my plan. So King Herod had a reputation in the community of being a fox, being deceitful, being sly, manipulating things to his own advantage. Now, can you imagine when you've got such a bad reputation with your community, bad reputation with all the leading men and high officials, a bad reputation with your stepdaughter, there's an intense emotion that wells up inside of you. I want to be accepted. I want to be loved. I want to be recognized. I want to be supported. I want to be forgiven. I want to win you over. And when you're in that desperate moment, out of desperation, on his birthday, he makes a rash promise. You see, a rash promise only comes from a place where there is th that intense emotion. Turn to someone and say, sometimes you are so emotional. Oh yeah, sometimes you are so emotional. Don't act so holy right now and so religious. Turn to someone and say, I am very emotional sometimes. And the men will say, me, we never, men are never emotional. Oh, come on, you oaks, you are so emotional. When we look at the word emotional... It's when there's so many feelings welled up in your life. Emotions. You're happy, sad, afraid, lonely, and mad all at the same time. And you look at your wife and you think, what's wrong with her? Then you look at uh, your husband and think, is it middle age? Is it a crisis? And then you look at your children, they're so emotional, they're all over the place. Then you look at your pastor and think, my word, even the pastor's so emotional. If someone says, stop being so emotional, they're telling you to calm down because your feelings are out of control. King Herod, on your birthday, you were an emotional wreck. So much drama in your home, you weren't thinking straight. You stood up to impress everyone because of your bad reputation. You've got a history of that. Your CV is not very cleaned up. 
And in that moment, you get up as an emotional wreck, filled with all kinds of emotions, happy about the dance, sad about the fact that everyone's talking about your bad reputation, you're angry, you're upset, you're not so happy with your wife because she's nagging to kill John. There's all this happening in your life. And so he just gets up and makes a rash statement. King Herod, you're out of control. Now, the opposite of emotional is logical. Logical things have more to do with your head, <laughs> while emotional things are all about your... Now, it's good to come into a situation with your heart, but please don't empty out your brain. I don't know why we as Christians, for some reason, we give our hearts to Jesus, and along the way we empty out our brain. God still gives us a mind to think and logic to reason. Come on now. We just need to renew our minds. So let's go back to the story quickly before I close. Are you ready? Because everyone wants to know, was he just all talk and no action? Or did he actually do what he promised? Well, let's go back. Mark chapter 6, verse 24. So... Salome, the 12-year-old, she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And I'm thinking, why did you do that? Why did you just say what you want? Why do you go back and ask your mother? Was it because you didn't know what to do? No, because by law she was 12 years of age and a 12-year-old daughter has no right to ask for whatever she wants. She's still under the law of her mother's will and whatever her mother wants, that's what she has to carry out. So she goes back to her mother and says, Listen, you my mother, what, do you, what should I ask for? Hey, Rodia says, this is my moment. So the head of John the Baptist, she answers, All the time I wanted that man out of my life. I want John the Baptist's head. Uh, can you imagine what went through Salome's mind now? This 12-year-old having a crush on the 30-year-old, being told your crush is going to be crushed. Head off. Can you imagine how she must have like, your eyes rolled back on oh, my mother. Or, oh my word. At once the girl hurried in to the king with this request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Yeah, it's easy to be all talk. It's very hard to be all action. Because, King, you made a promise. And what is a promise? A promise is a commitment to do something or not to do something. You have made a commitment. And that's why I said to you early on, we've got to learn not just to practice what we preach, but practice what we promise. Because we're good in being promise makers, but are we good in being promise keepers? We'll all be known as promise makers. Oh, my dad's making the promise again. There goes my mother making the promise again. Oh, my brother is making the promise again. And there goes my boss making the promise again of a, of a possible promotion and a bonus. All talk, nya, 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 nya. Turn to someone and say, stop being a nya, 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 nya. Let's go back to Mark chapter 6 and verse 26. I've got two minutes to do this. Bear with me. The king was greatly distressed. Now he's distressed. He's already an emotional wreck. Now he's even distressed and anxious and worried. What is everybody going to say? Because at least John the Baptist is not dead. He's in the prison. He's in the prison, but he's still alive. Now I've got to behead him. And I've got to bring that head into my banquet on a platter. Yo, age restriction. And because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. I guess I've got to keep to my word because everyone's watching me now. <laughs> so he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, brought back his head on a platter, he presented to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. Mm. And 
she got what she wanted. So this morning I want to close by turning to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And listen to this. Here's, here is a principle in relationship with God vertically needs to be practiced horizontally with each other. Listen to this before we close. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Let me tell you, when you're in a good place, guard your steps. When you're happy, guard your mouth. When you're angry, guard your thoughts. Whenever there is intense emotion being welled up in your life, whether it's in a happy place or a sad place or a bad place, guard your steps. Guard your thoughts and guard your mouth. Rather listen so that you can process before you make a commitment and make an oath with it. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Listen before you speak. Process before you commit. Don't be quick with your mouth. Verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. So the definition of a fool is... One who makes a promise ain't able to keep it. Do you know about the foolish behavior in our homes today? The foolish behavior in our workplace today? A lot of people walking around not even understanding the reality that they're speaking like a fool. They're making rash, quick vows, but they're not able to deliver. They're becoming foolish. Do you know foolish behavior leads to careless behavior, which leads to painful consequences? He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. It's better don't make a promise. It's better to be in that place. Because if you aren't able to commit and deliver, we become foolish. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin and do not protest to the temple messenger. Yo, 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 my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry? And what you say and destroy the work of your hands. We're living at a time, like I said with you last Sunday when I close, and I'm going to repeat myself quickly before we close. People have moved from reason to excuse. We've come out of a, a, a long season where reasons were valid enough to stay home, not feeling well to go to work, stay away, social distancing. We had to respect the boundaries, and the reasons were valid. But when you keep, keep using the same reason, I, I'm, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm so busy, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're going to keep using the same reason, that reason becomes an excuse. And it will start damaging your reputation and your credibility. And a lot of us become hasty to make quick commitments and then realize, wow, there's a, <clears throat> there's a cost involved. And then we bail out of it because we say, oh, I made a mistake. I didn't really mean it. No, no, you did mean it. It came from your heart because it came out of your mouth. So here's my last thought. I sound such, such, like such a preacher this morning. Last scripture, last idea, last thought, last minute. Like we've moved from reason to excuse. We've also moved from relief to pleasure. You know, we all need some time out at times. We all need some relief. So we make these promises to the kids. Kids, you behave yourself. This is what's going to happen. But in the background, you're just saying to them, I can have some time out. And so you enjoy some relief. But you know, let me tell you, when you get some relief, because you get tired and you get some relief, the tail end of relief is very pleasurable. How many of you have taken five days relief holiday just to find yourself? first two days, you're still trying to find yourself. But in the last two days, you have found yourself. And you're really enjoying the relief. Now, it's no longer relief. It's called now pleasure. But you still use the excuse, which was a reason, I need relief. Now you say, I need relief again. Now, what you're actually saying, I, I enjoyed the pleasure at the end, and I want more pleasure. So your reason is now an excuse so that we can experience more pleasure. Can you hear what I'm saying? And in the midst of all of that, we are emotional beings. And we make promises. 
And today we're living in a time where people are prone to look for convenience and they've lost their conviction. They've lost their conviction in their marriages. They've lost their conviction in their workplace. They've lost their conviction in their walk with God. Now everything is about convenience. God must fit into my calendar and into my diary so that it fits into my relief plan. In the meantime, it's not your relief plan. It's seeking for a pleasure plan. And we're living in a time when the Bible says very clearly that people are going to no longer be lovers of God. They're going to become lovers of money and lovers of pleasure because they were in a stage when they needed relief, but they didn't know when to stop and draw the line, and they went from relief to pleasure. They sacrificed their conviction, and life now became a life of convenience. God must fit into my plan. My wife must fit into my plan. My husband must fit into my plan. My kids must fit into my plan. Now, Pastor, can you stop preaching so you can fit into my plan? Next Sunday. Oh, I can't wait for next Sunday. Part three. Part three. All talk, no action. Or all talk and all action. Come next Sunday. I hope to see you here. To all our viewers online, it's been such a pleasure to connect with you. We'd like to just quickly pray with you before we end this time together. Father, we thank you for this word. It's a sobering word because we're all guilty of making promises. We're all guilty at times of intense emotion. We get so excited, so enthusiastic that we promise the world to the church. We promise the world to you. We promise the world to our kids, to our marriages, to our employers, to our employees. We make these rash promises from a place of intense emotion. And then we realize, oh my word, it's going to involve a sacrifice. And we don't understand the consequence. So, Lord, help us to guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our steps so that we don't make rash, foolish, and careless decisions and commitments and then have to embarrassingly stand up and say, oh, it was a mistake. But instead, Lord, we want to we wanna be people of all talk and all action. So help us to process life carefully. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. To all our online viewers, thank you for connecting with us. We hope that you'll connect with us again next Sunday, same time and same place. God bless you all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To all our visitors, don't judge us by one photograph. Come and visit us.